Morning everybody, my name is Anne Swain and I'm going to kick off with our APSCO Question Time Live today with a view that we have 172 people coming in to this discussion where hopefully we can ask a number of your questions. I'm joined by Tanya Bowers, who is the legal counsel for APSCO, Jamie Cassell, who is the partner of a big legal firm, uh, sorry, big accountancy firm, Safri Champners, and uh, Simon Clark, who is the executive chairman of an APSCO member, Harnham. I'm hoping that everybody can hear me. Okay, I'm, I've had no response, but I'm hoping everybody can hear me. I'm certainly not on mute. And what I will do is start asking some questions of our panel. Now, the questions that we've had coming in so far and more are going to arrive with us at any minute are things like, and this one I think is over to Tanya because we've had new news from the government with regard to the job retention scheme, particularly with regard to furloughing members of staff. And we know that this is something that is of interest to a number of APSCO members. Tanya, the question I've got here is, can furloughed staff do anything for me, i.e. for the recruitment company, or indeed another employer, or as a volunteer? Hello, Anne, good morning. Um, good morning. Once a um, worker is on furlough for you and um, their contract and they have been told in writing of this, they can't do any work for you. Um, the guidance does say that they could do training, but if you do want them to do training, then you have to pay them an additional wage to cover the hours they're spending on training, which must be at least um, the national living wage. And that can't be part of the grant. Okay. And the second, we obviously, sorry. Sorry, I was sorry, just going to say, the, the second part of the question you asked was, could they work for somebody else? The guidance yes. is silent on that. On the face of it, um, I think they might be able to. However, I think we need to be very cautious of constructing situations. For example, an agency worker could be put on furlough by one umbrella, but then be engaged by another umbrella to work through the same recruitment business. I think you should be extremely cautious of this sort of thing um, and, and need to play it with a very straight bat. Okay, what about volunteer work? Because I understand from the guidance that came out only at nine o'clock last night, there was mention of volunteering. Yes, they can do volunteer work, yes. Okay, excellent. Another question on furloughing is when will I be reimbursed because cash flow is a problem? We're not quite sure when HMRC software is going to be up and running. However, I think it's likely that it's going to be quite a few weeks. In the meantime, if cash flow is an immediate problem, there is the business loan, um, but I, I'm sure you have got questions later um, addressing the details of the business loan. I would. Yeah. Uh, what we will do is come to Jamie on this. The business loan scheme seems to not be working very well. Jamie, how do people cover their cash flow from a business loan scheme? Well, just, just coming back to the job retention first, I agree with, with Tanya. The issue that there's, that's currently out there is, is HMRC actually setting up a portal that um, for, for um, companies to go to to obtain the grant that they will get in relation to the job retention scheme. Um, they're trying their best to do it, but unfortunately it's taking a bit of time. From a business interruption loan scheme perspective, 
Um, the best way um, to try and get to that loan is to initially speak to your bank manager. Um, the business interruption loan is, um, is something that's been put in place by the government, but in the first instances, the government want you to go to the bank to see whether you can still get a commercial loan. If your business is able to get that commercial loan, then they will, um, the bank manager should then um, provide you with the opportunity to go to the business interruption loan scheme. Um, and you have to go through, unfortunately, the reason that it takes time to get the money is you have to go through the normal process as if though you are getting a loan. So that means the management account, forecast, statutory account, um, and once they have that information, then the loan um, will hopefully become available. Um, Jamie, we've heard, you know, uh, numerous members anecdotally giving us their view that where they have gone to their bank, the bank has pretty much asked them to uh, put their kidneys down as guarantee um, and their liver as an extra guarantee to get access to even the paperwork to actually get a loan. Do you feel um, the bank being open enough with this? Well, it's funny enough, it's, it's now got into the BBC News, which inevitably forces banks to relook at it. Um, there are some banks that don't request um, personal guarantees, um, and uh, they're pretty open about that. Um, and then there are some banks that are currently looking at it. Um, I suppose it's a bit like everything can. At the moment, um, there's a load of good measures that are being um, put out there by the government but it's a bit of uh, headline stuff at the moment and the detail still is being worked through. Yeah, I do think also that a number of recruitment companies just need to take a bit of a deep breath because feeling the need for that business loan in the first few days of us or first week of you know business dropping pretty much off a cliff for most of us um, is a bit like wanting to buy a whole shopping trolley of toilet rolls um, all at once with a view that just in case. And I do think that businesses really do need to get themselves prepared. But you're right, I'm not sure the banks have set themselves up properly yet. Just for everyone to know, there is a letter, a joint letter actually, coming out from Neil Carberry and myself to the banking sector and to the government to see if that can be loosened up, freed up, because I think the banks are feeling uh, a bit twitchy about how they are going to make sure they get that money flowing through to them and to make sure that they're not pushing loans to businesses that were always going to go belly up anyway. So there's yeah, going to be movement on this. Would, sorry, Anne, I would just add that there are other steps that can be taken in the meantime whilst you're trying to get the business interruption, interruption loan scheme, such as VAT deferral, um, which has come out and um, that's, that's now automatic. Um, there is also obviously um, the opportunity to speak to HMRC about time to pay for PAYE and NI. So there are bits and pieces that, that companies can currently do to try and um, ease the cash flow problems that they um, are having initially before they can get the business interruption loan scheme. Yeah. Okay. Let me carry on with some questions. So we've got questions coming through, but I say to any of you out there, if you want to ask a question, put them through to us and we'll do our damnedest in this hour to answer as many of those as we possibly can. Um, the next question I've got, which I'm aware actually that there isn't an answer to, but do staff that have been furloughed accrue holiday during that time frame? Tanya. The guidance is silent on holiday pay. Um, and that might be because it's um, not a statutory right in the same way as statutory maternity pay or whatever. Um, I talked to a few people about this. On the face of it, it seems fairly nonsensical that you will continue to accrue holiday when you're on a leave of absence. However, if you think of statutory maternity leave, you do continue to accrue holiday. So there is an example where that can happen. 
So I think businesses, not a great answer, but businesses have to decide on the right approach and they're in accordance with their, you know, taking legal advice or their risk, their happiness with risk or frankly how much money they have, um, their immediate approach on this. If they are going to change their not holiday pay policy, then they do need to ensure that it is in any contract variation. And I'm making an allowance for that um, in the precedent I'm doing. Also remember that subject to contractual rights of variation, you can vary additional holiday pay. The, the, the real risk is whether there is a duty to pay holiday um, entitlement under the working time regulations. This is something that individuals enforce through the employment tribunals rather than something that HMRC enforces. So that's actually quite, sorry, that's quite a long answer. I mean, I think if I'm summarising, we don't know because it hasn't been said yet. Um, but be careful, I think we would say on this. And I know, Tanya, that we are writing this morning to HMRC, to different people in HMRC, to see if we can get further clarification. And I'm sure that when we do that, we will put that um, out on a daily bulletin and make sure that ABSCO members can have a look and double check that. Is that right? Uh, yes, we will be sending points that we think we're clarifying through the HMRC. Um, we can't give any promises that they'll come back. You know, they obviously think very carefully before they issue further guidance. So we can't give any promises that we're going to get answers immediately. No, of course not. But I, what I would say to everybody out there that wants to know that, and it's uh, a good question, is that the minute that we have clarification, we will communicate that clarification out to you. Meanwhile, I do know that on the coronavirus resource hub on the APSCO website for members, there is uh, a standardised letter for furloughing staff and a whole range of details the translation of the guidelines to make sure that you know how to do that. I've got another question on furloughing here. So I'm doing a batch on furloughing. Bear with me. Any notice period or can you furlough with immediate effect? You need to give notice in writing to your employees that they're being in furloughed and keep that notice for your records. You do need to comply with your contract of employment, which is why I've taken the approach of saying a letter should be accompanied by a variation to the contract of employment. But it can be quite quick and it doesn't need notice. Okay, good. Simon Clark, can I come on to you with following staff? Is it something, as someone who heads up a successful recruitment company, is it something you would be considering at some stage for consultants or for other members of the staff? Um, yeah, I think that's uh, probably the best option that's come out of all of this for us anyway, um, in the medium to know. I mean, I think there's a few months of it left at the moment, and people suggest it might be presented. Uh, out of all the financial help that's come out, uh, you know, it is actually very good. It does sound like it's um, a bit of a no-brainer. Um, so, yeah, we're considering that, not just in the UK, but in um, America and Europe as well, with certain governments suggesting they're, they're following suit. The UK one does look very good, though. Um, and for us, you know, we haven't done anything yet. We wanted to wait until we understood in every territory what options were available. Um, and yeah, the furloughing thing for me is, uh, is is great in so many ways. It also shows that you know you care about your staff. That when the market does pick up, that you know you should be in a suitable position to, um, to take advantage of that. Are you finding that your recruitment staff have any business happening at all at the moment, or would it be okay to to drop them off such that they're not allowed to do any business that comes their way? Um, yeah, I mean, we've definitely experienced um, significant reductions in, in business. Um, with the furloughing scheme, though, and, and I will, you know, ask Tanya to potentially clarify this, but it seems pretty flexible in terms of taking them on and off furlough. Um, that you can, you know, you could furlough, let's say, for example, 30, 40% of your staff now and bring them back as and when job flow picked up. 
you can then put them back on furlough. Um, so I think it sounds pretty flexible and exactly the right move um, from can the you, government. Yeah. Can you let me come to you? Because I know there's a three week period, isn't it, for furloughing. Can you clarify that for us, please? That they have to be on furlough for at least three weeks. Yeah. Is that the question? Sorry. Sorry, Simon has said he's looking at furloughing people. He felt that the rules, and I think it's a useful thing as well, that some people can be switched on and then off and on and off. So there's a flexibility there. My view is it can only be for a three week period, no less than that. Can you clarify that point for us, Tanya? It has to be for at least three weeks. Um, I think then people can be taken off of furlough and go back onto furlough. Yes. Okay. But you can't um, furlough for less than three weeks. No, absolutely. So we need to be careful with regard to that. I've got a question that we may want to furlough people in March and April, but can we backdate it to the 1st of March? I know the answer to that, but Tanya, can you confirm that no, you can't? <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice try, whoever sent that in, but come on, reality check. You furlough from the date that you furlough uh, and not before. Another question related to that, that one of our members said that they had terminated four people on the 4th of March. Can these terminations be unwound and can they be furloughed instead? And good news on this. Tanya. Yes, um, if you have made people redundant um, since or, or terminated them since the 28th of February, then they can be re-engaged and put on furlough. I would just like to say, obviously, this is really very new guidance, so I would very strongly suggest to everybody on this call, if you haven't actually also read the actual government guidance on this, I would urge you to do so on, after the call as well as our Q&As when they're published. Okay, another question here, we're still on following the moment, there will be other questions we're going for. PAYE and national insurance contributions paid as normal while someone's being furloughed, Tanya? Yes, and that includes employer national insurance and minimum, minimum sorry, automatic enrolment employer pension contributions on that subsidised wage. If, if somebody's opt out, opted out of pension, then you don't have to engage them on pension for the purpose of furlough. But if they are in a pension scheme, then you do have to pay the minimum automatic enrolment pension contribution on that wage. And can you claim that back? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you can. So both national insurance and pension scheme can be paid, uh, can be claimed back, can't it? Yes, in addition to the the wage. Tanya, do, just to confirm yes. here, um, uh, that's employers NI and pensions A uh, contributions. Yes. What's your view on the employee tax and employee contributions? Um, well, the, the um, it, it comes back to the the time to pay, really. So, my and our understanding, and I agree with you, Tanya, that this is a moving um, uh, feast in the sense of the government's put it out there, but it, they're, they're yet to clarify the full detail of it. But our understanding is that you would pay PAYE and NI in the normal way, and then you'd get a grant back for the gross wage plus employers NI and pension contributions. Yes. Yes, quite. It says wages of furloughed employees will be subject to English income tax and national insurance as usual. Yeah. 
Can I just ask on that point, can we confirm what the situation is? If somebody, if a, a business tops up the 80%, say to 100%, um, my understanding is that the employer um, bit of that is still liable on the 20% that they've topped up and that bit is not refundable. Is that right? Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, Jamie, go for it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, inevitably, that that element of understanding is discretionary. So, um, if the employee uh, wants to carry on paying the additional twenty percent, then that in itself will go through the pay payroll. And again, the employer's NI and the, the the pension contribution won't be able to be um, uh, uh, granted back to them by the government. Okay, just so that everybody knows, Boris Johnson has just tested positive for coronavirus, um, which and has symptoms, which might be why um, Rishi was on his own, the casting was on his own last night. Let's carry on with this. Can, here's a question, and I know the answer to that. Can consultants or other employees still attend meetings? maybe internal catch-up meetings if they are, are on a furlough scenario. Let me go to Tanya again. No, they can't do any work for you. And you are putting the grant at risk if, if you do expect them to do some work for you. As in time, HMRC will need to put in some form of audit um, over this grant, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, we were concerned at one stage, uh, and Jamie, let me come. Hello. One stage that cash flow forecast or money in the bank was going to affect this job retention scheme, but I understand that that has not happened. Are we expecting anything to change on that? Sorry, Anne, you cut out a bit there. Can you can you just repeat the question? Hello, Jamie. Okay, there was okay. There was talk out there and some suggestions that there was going to be um, some kind of criteria for those companies that are able to be involved in the job retention scheme, i.e. that they didn't have a bank account with loads of money in it um, and did not have cash flow scenarios. Can we confirm that has not been part of what the government have said and that this is available to all companies? Well, it is definitely, what from what we've seen, it, it is definitely available for all companies. Um, uh, and I haven't seen anything that, that, that would suggest otherwise. Okay. I could we, uh, yeah. jump in there, Anne, just so you know, that the loan scheme probably does work like that. So if you've got lots of cash in the bank and you've got a strong balance sheet, then the banks are very unlikely to lend to you with the business interruption scheme. Uh, the ones that I've talked to have suggested they need to see a significant lack of trade due to the coronavirus before they, they, they put you into that scheme. Yeah. Uh, well, I, fair enough, frankly, I'd say. I agree with that, Simon, but from a furloughing perspective, um, my understanding is, is that all, all companies are, you know, all UK businesses are able to, to, to take advantage of it. Yep, no, I've yeah. heard that. I believe that to be true. We were worried, actually, it was only going to be for certain businesses, but we're not worried about that now. Let me ask something with regard to what, what I think to be very good news is that uh, contractors through an umbrella company, an employment business, um, are also included as part of this furlough scheme. Can you confirm that, please? Yes. Um, anybody who is paid through a PAYE scheme um, can potentially get the benefit of this furlough scheme. The issue for umbrella companies is until the scheme is up and running, there's a cash flow issue. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I think what we, we also don't know, um, 
are things, you know, some of the technolo uh, technicalities about whether profit bonus is going to be included in that um, amount of money. Do you have any views on that or have you simply not heard yet? Um, it said in the guidance last night that fees, commission and bonuses should not be included when you are calculating that 80% of employees' regular wage. Yeah. However, depending on whether your commission is contractual or non-contractual, you, you may need to think about that when doing a notification and a var variation of contract for your employees um, if you don't intend to be paying commission while you're on furlough. But you certainly can't get it back from the government. So if we look at the, the reality check, I would have thought is that very few recruitment companies will have contractual commission payments. Simon, can I ask whether that's the kind of thing that you might have at Harnham contracted commission payments or would they be out of the contract? Ours are out of the contract. They're on a schedule which can be um, changed at any time. Um, so I don't, um, yeah, but I, I imagine if you are, if you do have the employment contract, then you probably would have an issue there. Tanya would be the best person to, to, to give you more on that. Yeah, look, the reality is I would find it fairly rare if people do have that. The only situation people tell you might have it is if somebody's a relatively new consultant, let's say, who is on a guaranteed commission, but that would probably be on an offer letter rather than on the contract, would you say? Um I think it's difficult. It's a case by case assessment, to be honest, when you get into the minutiae. Um, you definitely can't get it back from the, the government. So it's more a question of whether you can just change your policy full stop or whether you have to vary the contract. OK, more questions think, coming in. Um, um, just to interject there. So I think if you're in a situation where you are contracted to pay a lot of commission to someone, um, you, you can have an, you know, an adult chat about it and just say, look, you will be someone that we might have to consider terminating if things get tricky. And, you know, if, if you were to volunteer to do this, then, you know, it would certainly save a lot of pain. I know that, you know, it could be construed as um, all sorts of problems with HR, but I think that Tanya again can, uh, can um, back me up, or not back me up, but explain um, further on that. But, you know, if, if someone was at risk of being laid off, then I'm sure an adult chat would, would, uh, would suffice. But... Tanya, what's yeah, your view I, with regard to that? Is that off the record chat something that could bite you in the bum later on? Uh, I don't think it needs to be off the record. I think it's an on the record chat of, of the reality of the situation because it's about getting employees agreement um, to change. And obviously, if they understand the stark commercial realities, then they, they're likely to agree. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. There is also obviously the, 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 the business reality that that um, you may have to defer the payment of commissions until post yeah. this dip that we're currently going through. Yeah, that would yeah, make sense. Yeah, very good point. Okay, another question I've got here, which I think has sort of already been answered, but maybe worth just mentioning again can an employer be furloughed part way through a payment period and could we retain certain employees until mid-april and still be reimbursed for the second half well there is a three-week scenario tanya can you just confirm that please um you you need to decide who of your staff to put on furlough by objective criteria. Um, so certainly you could have some of your staff put on first on furlough at the beginning of April, and but you could then subsequently decide after Easter that in fact you need to put more staff on furlough and do so. It, does, it can be at any time, it doesn't have to be at the beginning or an end of a pay period. 
I don't think they necessarily intend it to be used where you're swapping people in and out of furlough. I couldn't give a firm view on that. I don't think that's necessarily the intention of the furlough. Um, but any period of furlough can't be for less than three weeks. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add on that? Well, my understanding is, is that, that, and Tanya, you may, you may correct me if I'm wrong here, but furloughing is very similar to making people redundant. The purpose of the furlough is to replace the redundancy approach, but in reality, you have to go through that same process, so you have to consult with your employees you have to have a plan in place in relation to those that are being furloughed that needs to be sent to or, or HMRC need to have a look at. Um, and you've got to go through the, the normal process um, um, as if though they were going to be made redundant, even though they're not being made redundant. Is that right, Tanya? Do we need to go through that length of process or can it be quicker and more brief than that? The guidance, I mean, the guidance doesn't go into that level of detail. Um, and I'm really working off of the guidance. I mean, certainly that, that's been my approach to members, um, that you have to be seen to be fair and objective in deciding who should go on furlough. Yeah, that's not the advice we've got either so far. <laughs> That it's um, you know you have to come up with objective measures and fair measures if it was to be um, looked at by anyone afterwards. And you know yeah, in an ideal world you could say okay, well, anyone with less than six months experience were furloughing them, that would be a really easy thing to do. Um, but I'd have certainly haven't had, had advice. We'd have to have a consultation. Well, it's not you don't have to go through the consultation, but you have to certainly be um, letting your employees know that this is what's happening. Yes, it is a variation of contracts in effect. I mean, the employment contract doesn't just fall away. So you do need to, yeah, as you say, consult, and I would suggest vary the contract. Okay, so I've got a question um, tied up with the accrued annual leave, which we don't have the answer to. But if there were accrued leave, does probation period, or does that pause, or would it be the same with years of service? Do we pause years of service? Do we pause probation period? Good questions, actually. Jamie, do you have a view on this? Um, uh, that's, that's, I think that's that's more of a legal question than a... Than a accountant's question i mean it's quite difficult it basically comes back to what tanya's saying which is there's so much um or there's still little detail in relation to everything in relation to it but i'll leave it to tanya to answer more than me okay tanya yeah i mean there's just no information on this level of detail at the moment if you took you know it, it, and even on layoff, you know, the only comparable under English law is laying people off. But again, this tends to be used in certain industries such as construction, for example. There's not really any case law, as far as I'm aware at the moment, that would go into that level of detail of talking about whether probation's extended or years of service. I would be very surprised if there was a break in years of service. I mean, I, I'm pretty confident in saying this isn't going to be a break in years of service, although that is my opinion. It is only my opinion. Probation, again, I'm less clear on, but it is a, if it's a suspension of contract, then presumably you could suspend the probation and pick it back up when they come back. But I just want to stress, this is my opinion. It's not that I've read, I've read something. But that it does make sense. So I think, again, it's about documenting, doing things fairly. And I think, yeah, the, the, the detail of that will follow, but it might be a little way off. We've got a question here. Does the scheme apply to temps under contract for service 
And who would do that? Is it the agency or the client? Um, Tanya, it's an easy one to answer that, I think. It does apply. It would be the person that runs the PAYE payroll. So if the agency worker is on a PAYE payroll with the recruiter, it will be the recruiter. If they are employed by an umbrella company, it would be the umbrella company. Yeah. It, okay, it, it next will question will not here. be paid by the client. Well, unless you agree it with the client. <laughs> Okay, um, Jamie, let me come to you, to you on this one. What is the correct way to calculate the monthly furlough payment from weekly wages? Do you have a view on that? Um, that's a, that's a, a, a good question, but inevitably the, the way that it works is, is that you would, the, 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 the furloughed worker or employee would still go through the company's payroll so if the company pays it pays them on a weekly basis or a monthly basis they would calculate their pay as normal through the the um the uh, the payroll that they that, that they do on a weekly or monthly basis and then that would be set um, hmrc through the portal Maybe i think that's a problem with your microphone uh, I don't know if you can hear it. I think you've got a problem with your microphone now. Jamie? Hello? Yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know if you can hear me, but I think it's a problem from your microphone. Okay, sorry, I don't know where I got to, but I'll, I'll say it again. But the, the, the payroll, um, what would normally happen is, is that the company would, do, would, would put the employee through their normal payroll. So that would either be on a weekly or monthly basis. They would calculate the net pay and the, the, the PAYE and NI that needs to be paid. That then would be go to HMRC through the portal that HMRC is setting up, who would then give them the grant. Okay, thank you. I've got a different type of questions question now, which is an interesting one. From a mental health perspective, we have some staff who live alone. They've asked if they can still call clients and candidates just to catch up and talk and be able to speak uh, to people. Jamie, it's your microphone again. I'm assuming they're meaning if they've been furloughed, because otherwise, pretty much of course. Can we clarify this point? Um, can I go to Tanya? Um, no, I'm afraid, I know, I appreciate that people living alone, this is a very difficult time, and I appreciate that as employers, you will be looking at ways that you can support your employees. For example, we've got an APSCO WhatsApp group that, you know, seems to be giving people some a distraction, shall we say, but no, they can't work for you when they're on furlough, so that would include people in touch with candidates and clients. Okay, Simon, if I come to you, have you put anything in place at Harnham that keeps staff in touch with each other or just, you know, trying to look after them, keep them engaged in any way? Yep, um, fortunately we have this line which we purchased a little while ago, which is a uh, um, access all your staff to mental health um, practitioners, um, which is pretty good. Um, so they can call and talk whenever they like to these guys. And I'm sure we can we find out the details later on if anyone wants them. Um, but throughout the period so far, we've introduced all sorts of you know games and fun things to do. Like I think today, you know, it might be a bit cringy, but they're all wearing hats and sending pictures to each other. Um, and you know, there, there's virtual groups at four o'clock on a Friday. There's WhatsApp groups. There's lots of you know. Um, when they're working, you know, they're celebrating wins over email. Um, there's lots of Zoom meetings in the mornings. We also, you know, to keep an eye on KPIs, we we'll sort of also make sure that we're doing at least three meetings a day where they all join in for like 15 minutes so that everyone, you know, does as well as they get the benefit from um, talking to people, we get the benefit of making sure that, you know, everyone's still on track. Um, but yeah, you, know, you will find the younger they are, probably the more savvy they are with social media and technology anyway um, and have these little things going on you know little games and things like that that they can do 
Um, you know, you can do you can do so many things. Um, you, there's this house party app as well. There's quizzes you can all play on your mobile phones together. Um, but I would just do. I, I mean, you know, what we normally do is nominate someone who would be in charge of that. Um, when we try and roll something out every day, some sort of game. You know, we've also introduced. Um, uh, motivational things for BD or whatever, where you know, they get an Amazon voucher for 50 quid to buy groceries with, or send them a bottle of wine or something like that, um, just to keep everyone engaged and um, you know not not too lonely. Okay, can I ask you something with regard to KPIs and targets? What have you done to look at? I mean, to try and be realistic with what business is going to be done in this time frame. What sort of things have you been putting in place to? to tailor what KPIs might look like or what targets might look like? At the moment, we haven't reduced targets. I'm sure we're going to, you know, there's a potential we might have to. Um, but it, what we've done is just changed the direction of activity. So, you know, we're expecting a lot more business development um, now than we were previously. Um, and, you know, the, the reality is that they're all going to be harder. You know, all these activities are going to be harder, but there still needs to be effort going into them. And you can't always judge people on the success of these um, activities, but you certainly can judge them on the level and you know, amount of these activities which we're, we're, we're focusing on more more than revenue at the moment and i think you know the reality is just keep in touch people and getting leads for business that is going to come in in maybe two or three months when this blows over um, but you just need to change the direction of the kpi more to effort rather than success and you know you obviously want success as well but um you, know, you, you have to bear in mind that you know a lot of people aren't going to be recruiting at the moment but you want to be there for when they do pick up and you know you're on the phone from the soon to blow over. Yeah. And um, are you finding that any business is actually being done? Any actual billable business is being done at the minute? Yep. Yep. And there's definitely sectors that are still recruiting. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of health and pharmaceutical industry doesn't seem to be as affected as badly. Um, certain um, types of financial services, you know, there's a lot of trading going on in these um, tumultuous times. So there's definitely area, areas there. Anything that's perhaps research-based, project-based, where they're in the middle of a project and they're not going to stop it because they've already invested so much money, you know, which could be in you know, all sorts of manufacturing, um, drug testing, um, you know, big projects. Um, those things will still be ongoing. You, know, you might find that people are more um, interested to look at contractors. It's a good time potentially to be a contractor because of the uncertainty. Um, so there, there will be markets that will go up. You know. We've obviously seen, um, I'm sure people have seen that Netflix stock has risen and you know, there's, there's certain things that will go up. You know, the supermarkets are doing pretty well. Um, so there will definitely be industries and sections of the job market that will, 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 will carry on. But you've got to work out what they are and how they relate to your, your treatment company um, and, and where you can make the best of that. I would, uh, yeah. I, think, uh, I would concur with what Simon's saying. Um, a lot of our clients, um, are saying similar things um, in relation to business, new business, um, uh, and it does depend on the sectors that they're currently in. Yeah, I certainly have um, only last week signed up for the first time with Netflix. I thought it was about time. We were Sky people, but we've now got Netflix. I certainly uh, recommend Stranger Things, which is the only thing we've been watching, but we've binge watched it, finished the second series in a week, really. Uh, fantastic. Okay, let me get on to some more questions here. We've got a member of staff who we moved off of PAYE in April last year to be self in, a self-employed contractor. Does that mean she falls out of the self-employed amount offered by Rishi yesterday? I've got an idea of the answer of that one, but Tanya, let me come to you. Um, it may be a better one for Jamie. I would say she may fall within the criteria for the self-employed help. But what do you think, Jamie? I, I would agree. Um, it's uh, it's a, the self-employed arrangement is not dissimilar to the to the um, job retention scheme um, arrangement, um, but obviously it's focused on the self-employed. So um, that person, if they are self-employed and they're, 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 they are seen as a contractor, then they should be able to uh, um, go into the self-employment income support scheme. Okay, good news. Another question. If you are topping up salaries, 
are they able to work the hours that you are paying for? Um, Tanya. No, I don't think so. Because like, if, no, they're I don't think furlough, so. if they're on furlough, they're on furlough, they can't work for you. Unless, you're, unless they're doing training during that time. But that wouldn't be topping up. That would be, that would be payment for time spent training. Okay, another question. I've got someone who um, said they missed the first few minutes of this, and we did cover it actually. Um, but let, let's cover it again. Do we have to offer furlough payments to PAYE contractors? Jamie. Um, that's, that's, uh, I, 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 can I defer that to Tanya? Because it's, it's, it's my, my, my understanding would be no, but I'd rather defer it to Tanya. Okay, sorry about that. I'm picking the wrong people for this. Tanya. I, don't, I think it's if, if they're run through your PAYE, you can, you don't have to, as no. long as you don't breach your contract with the agency worker. And it depends whether you have your agency workers on an ongoing overarching contract services or whether you terminate them, terminate the whole contract after every asylum and restart. So you can't breach your contract with them or you shouldn't do, but you don't have to offer them furlough, but obviously the government wants you to try to offer them furlough, but realistically, you're going to struggle to be able to offer them the furlough until the grant scheme and the online portal's up and running, and you've got the money flowing through the system. Yeah, a question here on the same sort of subject, but something specific, is can you pay your furloughed workers monthly to reduce admin and cash flow impact, even if you use, usually pay your temps weekly? Jamie? Is that um, one for me? Or is that one for you, uh, Jamie? Yeah, I, I, I defer to, to, to Tanya, but again, it would be a, a variation of employment, I would have thought. But I'd be fair yeah, to be, I think I think you can, Jamie. I agree with Jamie. You can, but you would have to vary the contract for services with them. Okay. Um, people are looking at this furlough thing pretty seriously, and they're trying to look at the angle really that they don't void any reimbursement claim. Can contract? Uh, sorry, can our staff who are furloughed? continue just to do networking on LinkedIn from off their own back so they put themselves in a better position when they do come back. Would that void a reimbursement claim? Tanya. <laughs> oh, it, look, it, it depends whether this is them just doing personal networking or whether there's an expectation from you that they should be doing it or whether they're doing it under guidance. What do you, what do you think, Simon? Um, I'd, I'd concur with that. I'd say, you know, that if they got on with it on their own, um, you know, on their own and you didn't ask them to do anything, I mean, I think the key is that you're not expecting asking, directing them to do anything like that and it's not written down for anyone to see, um, you know, then this is it's not none of your business, is it? But if they did it off their own back, um, then, I, it's a social networking site that they own, so it's not company. Um, so I'd imagine you'd be all right with that, but it would be, you know, it's, it would also have some risk, I imagine, but I think it would be minimal. I'm certainly not telling you to do it so that way. I think, yeah. I think what we do need to be careful here is that whenever you get a disgruntled employee that leaves your business at some stage, do not give them an opportunity to use any of this against you. Um, and therefore, do not direct your staff to, to do any work of any kind if you're furloughing. If people using their own, so they certainly shouldn't be using a company LinkedIn. If they Good happen point. to be working on their own Facebook or LinkedIn, that's about them as an individual. You have not asked them to do that safeguard yourself we all get the occasional disgruntled employee do not get in a situation where there is anything that 
means they can bite you later on. Is that fair, Tanya? I agree, and it was a very good point. Very often in your contracts now, or in your letters, you seek to have some degree of ownership over employees' LinkedIn accounts whilst they're your employees. You need to look at your own policies on that. If, if you seek, you know, it's a difficult position if one day you're seeking to almost control their personal LinkedIn and the next day you're saying it's nothing to do with you. So I just think you need to be careful about this. I think the government is acting in, in good faith with this scheme. And, I, you know, without wanting to sound preachy, I think there is an element of good faith that needs to be given in return. Yeah, I would just add, Tanya, and, and correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong here, but it's a bit, it's, it's like anything, isn't it? As long as you've documented what you've said to, that, to the employees that are being furloughed, in relation to LinkedIn and what they can do and what they well what they can't do, um, there's no, there's not much they can do. But what they can't do, then then from your perspective, you've done as much as you possibly can. Whether they go off on their own and they start doing it through their own LinkedIn site, um, one would assume that you would potentially have to keep a, an update on it just to make sure there's nothing there that could um, cause a concern from the grant. Okay, let me move on to the next question. We've only got about nine minutes to go on this, and there's quite a few questions. Um, here is one. Jamie, I think it's for you. It's got calculated in the question, so I'm going to you. Okay. Is the furlough payment calculated based on time worked or cash paid? For example, in the calculation period, candidate submits 10 historic timesheets in one month to be paid? Um, again, I would um, su suggest that it depends on the contract itself. So if there is backdated um, or, 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 or prior, previous timesheets that have yet to be paid, um, then um, it's, it's something that needs to be looked at and then determined whether it can be included within that furlough period um, but it's again dependent on the what the contract says in the, the employment document it's quite, okay. a, it's quite a difficult one to answer at the moment because there's been no detail around the calculation of it um, yeah it's similar to what tanya said the, the the government are doing it in good faith so therefore they expect businesses to act in the same way. Yeah. I would I would add that I would treat personally, I would think that you would treat agency worker invoices or a payment due to agency workers for, for work performed um before you put them on furlough. In this personally, I would say you should treat that in the same way as you would treat employees' wages. Um, if it falls due for payment, you should pay it. Um, the government, in the guidance, it does explain how to calculate earnings on which to pay the grant um, for employees who pay varies. I'm not going to go through it because it's quite a mouthful and it's a few paragraphs, but there is explanation in the guidance that should help, although might not have all the answers. Okay, let me come on to another question, a slightly different one. Recruitment owners who take dividends of over 50k don't get any help at the moment. Is that correct? Tanya? Um, well, yeah, um, I think it's they're not really while well, they self-employed i guess if they were a one-man band self-employed jamie might be a better one to answer that you i, know, I would say if yeah jamie i would say the, the answer is that inevitably you will then have a self-assessment tax return to fill in and what's currently coming out in the, in the guidance that we've seen is that those that have self or are doing self-assessment tax returns there is an opportunity to defer the, the, um, the payments in relation to it, so the July payment. So um, there is 
um, potential um, to um, not pay the, 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 the dividend amount based on your tax return um, uh, uh, imminently, i.e. this July, um, but there's nothing in relation to furloughing, there's nothing in relation to um, um, uh, deferring of any sort of payments apart from either a self-assessment, time to pay for POI and NI, and also the furloughing. Jamie, it may have been um, a question in sort of a response to, let's say, someone had some money in their business um, that they were scared of losing. Um, you know, that if they were to then take the money out and then go for the government schemes, would they be rejected from the furloughing schemes or anything like that because of the fact they took money out of their company? I'd imagine that's the, the gist of it. Um, oh God, that's a very good question. I haven't seen anything that would suggest that... Um, uh, would I, I, in, in, I haven't seen anything that would suggest that, but then again, um, it's more of a it, it's it really will the furloughing is more a employment question, less so about whether you're taking money out of the business. Um, the question that inevitably the, the question that would be rise, raised by HMRC is why are you taking that money out? Why don't you use that to pay your employees instead of putting them on furlough? But um, again. It's, it's a bit up in the air. Yeah, I haven't seen anything about that either. But I would imagine if you went for a bank loan, that would be an issue. Um, generally, anyway, they would probably it would use, put it, it back. Be, I agree. It would it would be a concern if you're taking money out of the business when that money could be used to help the business. Okay, let me come on to a slightly different question, and I'm not sure that there are answers yet to this. But does the apprenticeship levy get reimbursed in addition to NI, uh, employers' national insurance and um, employee pension and employers' pension contribution? Do we know anything about the apprenticeship levy on this? The guidance is silent. Jamie, have you heard anything on this? Um, not, not that my employment tax guys are telling me. So um, again, I'd, I'd probably agree with you, Tanya. It's a bit silent at the moment. Okay. So sorry to whoever asked that question. We simply don't know at the moment. Let's hope we can ask for further clarification from HRC, and we will let you know what happens with regard to that. Another question. I think I know the answer to. In terms of the three weeks, is this in one continuous block or could this be three one-week blocks? Tanya, quick one there. Needs to be in three continuous weeks. It does. Okay. Um, is there a reference to the guidance from the CJRT that is discretional bonus payments are not within scope? This is how most umbrella companies operate such that the umbrella employee is guaranteed a national living wage salary and discretional bonus and the latter being the difference between the national living wage and the umbrella rate less the employer costs and margins do you have a view on that tanya bonuses are out of this i know this is something for the umbrellas to determine um, as you say, bonuses are out of it. Um, it is something between the umbrellas and the um, the agency worker. We we are talking with umbre our umbrella affiliates, so you know we may have um, a view on how the market is operating over the over the next few weeks. But I suspect the umbrellas are still very much thinking about how to apply this but as you say on the face of it bonuses are excluded from what they can recover from HMRC. Okay another question I'm moving really really quickly we're due to finish at any time I know the answer to this can you furlough staff that you have offered but have not started yet? No unfortunately not there will be a gap where we have made permanent placements, but the person hasn't started their job or indeed offered and are waiting for staff for ourselves to uh, join, but they cannot be furloughed unless they were on at the end of February on your payroll. 
Is that right, Tanya, or have I misled anybody? No, perfect. Um, I'd you. also add to that that anyone started, let's say, between the end of February and today, that they also can't furlough them, um, from what I've, I've heard. But again, I'll ask Tanya that question. Tanya, that's not quite my view. My understanding is that anyone who started a job from the, is it 28th of February, can be furloughed. Can you clarify? Well, I'll just read out the line on the guidance. The scheme is open to all... Oh, no, that's sorry. That's about employers, 28th of February. Um, Furloughed employees must have been on your PAYE payroll on 28 February and can be on any type of contract. The scheme also covers employees who are made redundant since 28 February if they are rehired by their employer. Yeah, so I would That's imagine so we have a situation where people have started between the 20th February and now that we can't furlough. And that's probably a yeah, good uh, agree. Um, interesting or important people to understand. Okay. Right. What I'm going to do is to bring this session to an end. We said it would be an hour long session. We still have lots of questions. I think that suggests to me we will schedule more of these um, apps go question time live sessions to happen on a regular basis especially as new legislation is coming through and new guidance is coming through for a range of things. I want to thank Tanya Bowers, the legal counsel of APSCO France and Nice, for Jamie Cassell, who is the partner of Safi Champners, and Simon Clark, who's the executive chairman of Harnham, for giving us their time and their expertise in this. Thank you to you, 172 of you actually, that tuned in. I hope that we've come a long way to answer your questions. Be aware the APSCO legal helpline is pretty inundated, as you can imagine. And there are frequently asked questions on there. We need to update them with the new guidance because it's only this morning that really obviously we've put the guidance up there. They are busy. Have a look at the frequently asked questions and guidance where we try and answer those before you need to go to the APSCO legal helpline. But if you do need to go that there, it is there and will answer your questions from a legal point of view. Meanwhile, we hope that this has been um, educational for you. We hope we've answered most of your questions and we look forward to replicating one of these sessions early on next week. Um, stay safe. I've been saying to my staff, um, be careful out there that only those of a certain age that watch Hill Street Blues will understand. But do be careful, do be safe and stay healthy. And let's hope that we can help you to keep your business healthy as well. Thank you for tuning in. Do take care. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you.